talk about self-talk. We know that uh, the person you talk to more than anyone else is yourself. Uh, it has been said that you say 95 words to yourself for five words that you say to other people. You are your number one conversationist, right? You have a constant, ongoing commentary about everything that happens in life inside your head that nobody gets to hear but you. Therefore, it's important what's going on up there. So this is about self-talk. Our, our pastor kind of, he touched on it, and, and I ended up doing a devotional on it service on a Sunday night. And so I think the thoughts are important enough that we can go through them together. I want you to start with, with Psalm 94. And we see, um, we see the psalmist here that David has a very healthy a very healthy thought life, or he has very healthy self-talk. Okay, verse 19, he says, In the multitude of my thoughts, within me thy comforts delight my soul. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Okay, so here's a man who sits and speaks to himself, and what he hears himself say to himself comforts him. Doesn't beat him up, doesn't torture him. You know, our thoughts can be torturous, can't they? Our thoughts, once, once our thoughts go against us, they can really be torturous against us. Or once our thoughts go against somebody else, all of a sudden there's no more peace, there's war inside of my head. Uh, and yet this psalmist said in the multitude of his thoughts that there was comfort for his soul. Um, if you would go to Psalm 139, this is a famous, the famous uh, chapter of the Bible that tells us that, that abortion is not correct. Because we see here that God knows every person before they are born and he knows everything about them before they are born. But that's not the point this morning or this afternoon. But the point is, if we look at verse 17, we see what, what David is, what he thinks about. When he thinks about God, what does actually goes through his head? And so verse 17 says, how precious are your thoughts to me. That thinking God's thoughts to David was a precious thing. Those are the thoughts he wanted to think more than any other thoughts. They were very dear to him, like a prize in his mind. He said, how precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And then verse 18, if I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I am, when I am awake, or when I awake, I am still with you. When David considered God, he considered the number of thoughts that God has concerning him. And he said, one, those thoughts are extremely precious to me. And two, he said, they are so many, they are as many as the sands of the sea. That's how much God is thinking about each one of us. I wonder, uh, you know when Peter denied the Lord, right? He said, Lord, I will go to the cross, I will die for you. And Jesus said, no. You will deny me before the cock crows three times. And you know what happened. Oh, you are, aren't you one of those Galileans? I don't know what you're talking about. You were with Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. Wait a minute, but you have an accent from Galilee. You surely are one of him. Darn it! I don't know what you're talking about. And he goes away and then, boop, boop, boop. he denied the Lord three times. Now you can imagine the thoughts that went through his mind. Jesus told me I was going to do this. I am, I have, I have betrayed the Lord. He is so awesome. He healed my mother. He is a blessing to me. I can't believe I did this. And imagine if he, now he went back to fishing. Jesus that suffered, died, was buried, and then he went in his, one of his post-resurrection appearances. Peter is on the boat, and Jesus comes up. And what do you think if someone said, Hey, Peter, Jesus rose from the dead and he's going to come and talk to you. What do you think would be going through Peter's head? What would be his self-talk? Oh, man. 
I'm going to get a whooping. Oh, man. He's going to scream at me. He's going to be so angry. I did just what he said I would do. Maybe that's what was would be going through his head. But when the Lord came, you remember what he said, hey, boys, you know, and he, he cried out to me. He said, it's the Lord. And Peter, like, dove in the water and came swimming after him. And Jesus con confronted him and said, Peter, do you love me? That's, that's what he said to him. Peter, do you love me? He didn't. Peter, you do not love me. You denied me. You do not love me. But instead he said, Peter, do you love me? And he used this word, agape love. Do you love me unconditionally? And of course, Peter's probably saying no. But instead he said, no, but I love you like a friend. I love you, phileo love. And Jesus said, do you love me? And he said, well, Lord, no, I, I, you know I love you like a friend. And Jesus said a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know. You know. And the Lord said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He was so, it was so different than what you would expect. And the Lord kind of, you could say he, he adjusted <clears throat> Peter's self-talk. Maybe reprimanded because he was so loving. Peter thought, might have thought to himself, why did I think that Jesus would have been mad at me? Why would I think that? Well, of course I think that because that's the way guilty people think. But people who know the Lord, we learn our thought life changes. It changes. Here, I'll show you a couple more things. So, you know that um, the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. Right? He is called the Comforter. And I, there's some, there are some um, verses. Stay in Psalm and go to Ecclesiastes 4. Ecclesiastes 4.1 just talks generally about the world and about what kind of comfort there is in the world. Here's what it says in verse 1. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. This is Solomon who wrote Ecclesiastes, uses this term under the sun, and it means like in the world. I've noticed all the oppressions that are under the sun, and they had no comfort. And on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comfort. The world is filled, is filled with oppression, oppressive thoughts, heavy thoughts, condemning thoughts, threatening thoughts that produce a great fear. But God has got a different voice, and it's the voice of the Holy Spirit called the Comforter. It's this word parakletos, parakletos, and it means to call alongside. Like, like the Holy Spirit would say, would, would say hey, Ren, come to my side. Come to my side, I want to talk to you. Come to my side, I want to walk with you. That's what the comforter is. He is the parakletos. He is the one who calls us along to his side so that he can speak words to us. So Jesus told his disciples that the comforter was coming. And we know the comforter came at Pentecost. In John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. You know, imagine if Jesus were on the earth today. Uh, I did a calculation. If Einstein, let's say Einstein was still alive, and, and Einstein wanted to see every person on the earth, right, one time in his life. He just wanted to see every person one time. If he lived 50 years, right, 50 years, it would take him, he would have to see 383,000 people every day in order to see everybody one time in 50 years. Do you see why it isn't practical? Jesus said, it's good if I go away. Because otherwise, in order for me to see everyone on the earth, it would take me to see 383,000 people every day for 50 years. Instead, he said, I will go and my Father will send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be with each one of you all the time. You see the difference? Jesus, Jesus is with us. Here we are. Here he's, he's sitting. Lord, tell us. Tell us a parallel. Lord, 
What do you think about this? But then, well, what about the people in the church down the way? And what about the people in the house down the way? They don't have the Lord with them. So Jesus said, it's a good thing that I go because my Father's going to send the Holy Spirit who is going to be not with, only with you, but will be in you. That actually the Holy Spirit is with us 24-7. And what's He doing in us? He's thinking. He's talking. And I think so often our... Can, you, can we tell the difference between my thoughts and His thoughts? He said it like this. He said... He said, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, and my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are like heaven compared to the earth. That's how much higher my thoughts are than your thoughts. So you can see why it's so important the way that we talk to ourselves. Because if we speak to ourselves according to God's thoughts, then those thoughts are much higher. And you know what, what, what real life is like down here on the earth? What do we think about? Cars? Justin's worrying about the car. I'm well, not worried about it, but he's thinking about it. Got to get it registered. Jobs? On my biology exam? We know. We're down here. My friends? My girlfriend? My boyfriend? My, my salary? My health, maybe? My test scores? We know what it's like. My baby's diaper rash, Professor Choi. My baby's diaper rash. Got the, all that stuff is like it's connected to our soul and it like pulls us down. Like it's heavy. It pulls us down. And the Lord is saying, hey, there are thoughts that are high. There are thoughts that are heavenly. There are thoughts that are uplifting. There are thoughts that are comforting to you. Can you hear my voice? So, you know, when Pentecost happened, it was 50 days after the resurrection is when the Holy Spirit came down upon the church. It was, it was uh, the, the Feast of Pentecost. At that, so what, what then, that's, and for Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came into the church, into the hearts of the people. And now he is the comforter. There's another verse that's in John 14, 16. He says, and I will pray the Father and he will send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. This is the comforter in John 14, 26 that was sent down into the church. And he said, in John 14, 26, he said, but the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring things to your remembrance, whatever I said to you. But what are those things? And he said in, in John 15, 26, when the Comforter has come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Of me. So now, here we go. This is the grand conclusion. Jesus Christ is called the Logos, right? John 1, in chapter and verse 1. He said, The Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the Logos. It's the expression of God to us. It's called His Son, Jesus Christ. That Word became flesh and took on the form of a man in John 1.14, so that now we have the very Logos of God expressed to us. So now the Holy Spirit is going to, is going to teach us how to think. And what's He going to teach us? But he's going to teach us about the Son about four things about the Son. He died, He was buried, He rose again, and He sits at the right hand of the Father. That's Holy Spirit talk. <laughs> that is Holy Spirit talk. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of God who died for my sins, who was buried, and I was buried with Him, who rose again, and I rose with Him, and now is seated at the right hand of the Father, and and I am seated with him. Those are Holy Spirit thoughts. Because when you don't do well on an exam, or you have such a huge exam, it's a final exam. If you pass, you do you pass the semester. If you fail, you tank the semester. Or your GPA is hanging on this exam, right? The heaviness of this exam it causes so much stress that you can't even study effectively. Because everybody
everybody knows that the, the restful mind is the, is the mind that learns the best. So any stress that you have about an exam is counterproductive. The more you stress about an exam, the less or the more difficult it is to study. The more you stress about an exam, the less your mind retains while you do study. So what's the key? To not stress. Well, that's impossible. It's too important an exam. But what's the solution? It's the comforter. He's going to come and say, hey, this, do the best you can. You don't care about this exam. You study. Just do the best you can. And when you're done studying, you say, I'm done. And you go take the exam. Just relax. But you say, no, but if I think like that, I won't study so hard. Ha ha. That's the trick. No, if you think like that, then you need to study less. Because of the comforter that quiets our soul down. That's just one example, but it's true about so many things, whatever it might be. His message is one of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, I want to show you one, uh, one example in, in David's life. We already talked about David, but if you go to 2 Second, second Samuel, 1 Samuel 30, I want to show you this example, and I hope that, that we get this, because this is a key. Not every believer, when you are born again and you become a believer in Christ, you are not mature. Right? You are a young believer. And one thing you do not know is you do not know how to think like a, like a, a mature person. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says that when I was a child, I spoke as a child. But now that I am grown up, I put away childish things. The way children think is that daddy's mad at me. The way children think is, oh, here comes daddy, I got I to gotta hide that I'm going to get in trouble. But that's not a mature believer. Mature believers know more about God than that. And David knew about it. You know, you know the story. So David, David comes back after being in battle. He comes back with his men to Zik Ziklag, where, where they had left their wives and children and their cattle and everything. And the Philistines had come and they had attacked that Ziklag and they took everything. They took their cattle, took their wives, took their children, everything gone. And David and his men are there. And David's men all turned against him and said, it's your fault. Let's stone him. David, it's your fault. Of course they were bitter. Of course they were sad. They lost their families. They had to hate somebody. So they hated David because David was their leader. And what did David do? What did David do? It says, it says in verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David, you see that? David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's the key. When I'm in trouble, can I encourage myself in the Lord? A young believer can't. A young believer can't. It's, it, this is a point that we reach in our Christian lives. It's when Peter said that there is a day when the day, the day star arises in our hearts and we see him. Oh my gosh, when I think about Jesus, I don't think about Jesus born in a manger. I don't think about Jesus dying on the cross. I don't think about Jesus walking the earth. I think about Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, the firstborn of many sons, Actually, who I am, I don't, I see him. And if you see him, you can encourage yourself, Lord, I, I, it's so, it's stressful down here. I, you see the situation I'm in, but Lord, I know you are for me. I know you love me. Give me a response. Give me an answer. Help me in this situation. He encouraged himself. When he got in trouble, he didn't say, oh, no, God is against me. Why are, why did I do that? God, what are you? You are trying to punish me. You are trying to chasten me. Oh, Lord, I'm in such trouble. But instead, he encouraged himself. It's amazing. Can I encourage myself in the Lord? Can I fail and get up? Can I really get up? If I can, if the Comforter is there, if the Holy Spirit is there. And I'll, we'll close with them with this thing in Psalm 23. I think this is amazing. Psalm 23, about the difference between when times are not so bad, we see 
we see God in the third person. And we're going to see it in this, in this chapter. It's pretty cool. Watch this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Is that the... Which, which person is that speaking of the Lord? He. Third person, right? He. Third person. Where's the Lord? He is over there. David is not talking to the Lord. He is talking about the Lord. Right? He. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul, verse 3. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He's still talking about the Lord. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you. You are with me. You. Do you see what just happened in David's soul? God went from a he to a you. And I'm not talking about John you either. He went from a he to a you. Not from a lead to a you, a he. A he to a you. He went from he. I'm talking about God to I'm talking to God. I'm talking about God abstractly to I'm talking about God personally. Then he continues, Yea, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear to evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they Comfort me. They comfort me. Thy rod. And thy, what, did, what was a rod used for? Little. On the sheep. It's got this rod. Poof. The sheep gets a little. Oh, and it leads him along the way. Thy rod and thy staff. The staff can be used to, to, to rescue the captive. The staff can be used to defend. His rod and his staff, they comforted him. He, he had it. He saw it. What is God to me? He's a shepherd to me. He takes care of me. Then we continue. Thou prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Verse 5 is present, verse 6, is future. When David thought about his life, oh Lord, what's the picture I have of my life? What's it like? What's my life like? Here's the, you prepare a table for me. Right, here it is. Oh, Justin, yeah, you please, please sit down. I, I prepared a beautiful feast for you. Here you go. Find your seat at my table I prepared for you. And all of your enemies are all around you. But this is my table I have prepared for you. That's the picture that David had in his mind. It was a comforting picture. I wonder about the pictures that we have in our minds of when we think about what God is to us. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. My cup runs over. And then the future. When he thinks about the future, well, what about your future? Is it bright? Is your future bright? What about your future? Are you going to be okay? David thought like this. Lord, as I go, goodness and mercy follow me. As I go, goodness and mercy follow me. Everywhere that I go, uh, who are they? I, I, if I had our pastor that we passed away a few years ago, he had two dogs. You know what their names were? Goodness and mercy. Because <laughs> they would follow him everywhere, everywhere he went. Yeah, goodness and mercy. Come here, goodness, come here, mercy. Goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our lives. That's a healthy self-talk. Where's the fear of my future? There's no fear. Why? Because God is the one who prepares my table, and because goodness and mercy are going to follow me, not condemnation and evil. I, I lied, it's not going to be the last verse. In Jeremiah 29, 11, this is a this is a very a really famous famous verse that you all probably know very well, but in this context it's great. So Jeremiah, who is in who is in trouble, is thinking, what the Lord, what? What what do you have for us? What's going on here? As they are about to be carried away in back to Babylon. And the Lord 
the Lord talks about, about it, it answers the question, and he says in verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Really, Lord? You know what you're thinking about? You know your thoughts about me? Could you tell me what they are? No, don't tell me. I don't want to know. Oh, yeah, you better tell me. Oh, no, no, don't tell me. I'm too afraid. Like looking into some crystal ball or something. Who needs a crystal ball when we have the word of God? Who needs to go have our tarot cards read? Or our palms? 20 bucks to have your palm read. I saw that yesterday. ESP. Extrasensory perception. You can tell me my future by reading my palm. I don't need my palm read. Here's the, the verse tells me right here. What God's thoughts are toward me. Here they are. I know my thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace. And not of evil. Wow. Is your life going to be okay? How do you know? Because God's thoughts are thoughts of peace and not of evil. And then he finishes off with thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Or even more so, to give you hope in your final outcome. How's the day going? It's going great. Really? What about all the stuff that's going on around in your, in your life? Well, my thoughts comfort me. My thoughts comfort me. I walk down the street and I just, my thoughts bubble up. They are God's thoughts. In Colossians chapter 3, it says this. It says, let the word of God dwell richly in you and with all wisdom. Let's, let's go there. Let the word of God, this, and this is the key. And, you know, some people say, I've got to read my Bible. You know, every morning I'm supposed to read my Bible. Forget about the supposed to's in life. They'll all mess you up. It's not the supposed to's in life. We want to do the things just that are about life. Learning God's word is not about a supposed to, like learning biology. I mean, we got such a bad taste in our mouth for school anyway. Like how many people would go to school if they didn't have to? Well, I gotta do it. I gotta study. Why? Ah, I just have to. Because if I don't, you know, my life will be over. It'll be horrible. I mean, I'll pump gas. The parents of you either two two questions, two answers. James, if you don't finish college, you're gonna pump gas for the rest of your life. That's one thing. Or you wanna work at McDonald's for the rest of your life. Those are the two options, that's it. No other option if you, if you ever leave school. Those are, those are your only two options in life. You're either going to pump gas or you're going to work at McDonald's for the rest of your life. I've never known one person that works at McDonald's his entire life. Half pumping gas, half in McDonald's. No, <laughs> Glass and Jeff say, okay, here it goes. Let the word of God dwell richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Word admonishing is encouraging one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now that is a healthy thought life. Hymns and psalms in my head and just encouraging my brothers, encouraging my sisters in the Lord, encouraging me. How are you doing today? Today is amazing because of God. That's why today is awesome. And we, have, we sing songs of grace in our heart. It's a healthy self-talk. Walking down the pathway of the college, or walking on your way to school, or walking on your way to a job. And what bubbles up in your head? If it's not encouraging, if it's not from God, then you cast it down. So I'm not going to think about that. That's not what God has called me to think about. Now, you do have to think about certain things. Kevin Lange. Ochem. Ochem is like torture for the average man. Organic chemistry. I mean, how many enes and anes and ines could a person possibly learn? Horrifying thing. You're forced to stuff that stuff in your brain with the idea that someday it's going to be worthwhile to you. But God's thoughts are like, high, high. Lord, what are you thinking of me today? My thoughts towards you are precious. More than the sands. 
Not thoughts of evil, thoughts of good, because I have a plan for you. See what I mean? That's healthy. So that when we get in trouble, by God's grace, we'll have the, we'll have the ability in the Holy Spirit to pull ourselves aside and say, hey, I want to talk to you for a moment. Like David said to his soul. He said, soul, why are you so depressed? He's talking to himself. Why are you so depressed? Do you ever have a talk with yourself? You can do it in the mirror, or you can just imagine yourself sitting there and just talk to you. Listen, Sam, Sam, listen to me. Why are you so depressed anyway? Worship God. He's amazing. Praise the Lord for what he, the great things he's done. Do you get it, soul? I'm not going to take any more of your whimpering. And then our soul, what? What did I? Because God. It's about God. It's not about whether or not your car got stolen. So last story. You know what happened? I was fishing on Friday morning. I had such a great day fishing. I, I text my wife. Best day of fishing in I mean, such a long. It was such a blast. Caught ten fish, missed six. It was just awesome. So that's the first text I got. I sent her. Then I get on the, on the road and I walk down the road all the way down to where I thought my, my car was gone. My car was gone. I said, Oh my gosh, what could have happened? Look, I parked my car. Did it roll down the hill? Did I not put it in park or something? I looked down the hill. It wasn't down there. This is where I went in the woods. How could this possibly be? Call 911. Call the police, right? Hey, so I, I don't know. Someone stole my car. Is it no parking? Did it get towed away? No, it's, a, it's like where everybody parks. My car is gone. And I'm thinking, that's two fishing poles. That's hundred dollars, hundreds of dollars worth of fishing stuff. My waders, all the stuff that's meaningful to me got, is gone in my car also. So I'm sitting there. And so I call my wife, Paula. Listen, I just called the police. They're, they're on the way. I think my car got stolen. So Paula told all of her friends, Brian's had such a great day fishing. And then she turned, told all of her friends, oh, I take that back. <laughs> he got his car stolen. So I'm sitting there for 45 minutes on this, on the, you know, this perch on the side of the road waiting for the police to come. And I call at 911. Hey, you know, it's been 45. Oh, 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 they just came. They just came. So I hung up. The guy pulls up and said, You Brian Lynch, 6043 Yorkshire Drive? I said, Yep, that's me. He said, Your car is parked about 300 yards that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, he said, It seems like you got a little bit turned around in the woods. So I just, I don't know, I spaced out on, on uh, where I came out. I, actually, when I came out of the woods, I looked that way because I thought my car was down there. I walked a half a mile. But actually, if I had come out of the woods and looked that way, my car was like right there. <laughs> so, Lord, somebody stole my car. What am I going to do? I <laughs> said, so just, just relax. It's going to be okay. In this case, it really was okay. But I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if Justin would give me back my car. <laughs> you probably would have, by the way. You would have. No, you would have anyway. Even if you would have. So, uh, this, this, is a, this is a good, good, wholesome thing for us, isn't it? Just check out your thoughts, do a little triage. Are these thoughts edifying? When I think about certain people, is it edifying? Oh, this, people are just people. I'm not going to think evil of them. I'm not going to. I'm just, just going to think about how amazing they are, how awesome they are. God, what a great plan you have for me. I'm going to do the best I can. Put up one foot in front of the other and just think about Christ and what he's done and my future and his plan and, and people around me and just have a, like a skip in my step. Like, why not? And if not, then maybe you need a little bit more of what the Holy Spirit's trying to talk to you about which is in the Word of God. A little bit more learning about the Logos until you get a good picture of Christ in your mind. A great book by Philip Yancey about the, the Jesus that we never knew. It's really a good book. I just started it. And it's, uh, it's it, like this guy, Jesus Christ, is so, we can get a picture of him. And just imagine like a coach, look at him face to face. Lord, oh, Lord, it's just so awesome to be with you. You are so just a fantastic person, the way you think, the way you are. Thank you for letting me in the group. Oh, I'm 
church came out. I mean, intimate with him. You know what I mean? It's, it's so, and that's what the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us. If there was no death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the Holy Spirit would have nothing to tell us. I'm sorry, Aaron, I can't comfort you at all. You're lost in your sins. You're going to hell. I mean, there's very little good news. But because he'd suffered, died, and was buried, and rose again, and sits at the right hand of the Father, the Holy Spirit's got lots of good news for us. Every day it's the same good news. And we're thankful for it. Amen? Let's have a prayer together. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we can encourage ourselves in our hearts. And David encouraged himself. He encouraged himself. Lord, we want to be able to encourage ourselves that our thought life, our internal conversation would be edifying, Lord. That we could speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and make a melody in our hearts unto you. Thank you, Father, for this, this possibility, for this potential that we have. May we learn your word, may we learn your thoughts about us, because you've said your thoughts toward us are not thoughts of evil, but they are thoughts of good to give us an expectation about our futures, to give us hope. So, Father, as, as we go, may, may uh, these words encourage us. The Bible is not something that, that's, it's not a biology book or calculus or, or English lit or ancient history. It's, it's your book, it's the words that you have written to us so that we can know what your thoughts are toward us. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. We exalt his name in our hearts. We praise you and thank you so much for the Holy Spirit who is with everyone equally all the time. Everyone, we are children of the Holy Spirit lives within us. Thank you for that privilege. So that we have a comfort in this world and comfort to the world. So bless us as we go. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's stand up. And John, something with something.